No matter how big or small your team is, Ferguson has a winning game plan for pro contractors with thousands of plumbing repair parts, knowledgeable associates, and the largest national footprint in the game. When the pressure is on, count on Ferguson. You got to have a I don't give a shit attitude when it comes to what you're willing to put yourself through. The athletic part of it, the Gen X part of it, is the smaller part of it. Most of you, like listening to this podcast, you know, you get the guy that I'd have played if I wouldn't have torn this knee up. No, you wouldn't have. You know why? Because you're a p- you wouldn't you wouldn't have done it. It doesn't work that way. Welcome to the Jim Rome Podcast. This is F74, and my guest is three-time Super Bowl champ Mark Schlereth. Now, it's been a minute or so since I caught up with Stink. He used to be a regular on my radio program. He was a staple every year on Radio Row. He even served in as a fill-in host on JRIB back in the day. Happened to bump into him at the Super Bowl in Atlanta, so I knew we had to get caught up proper right here on the pod. And for a guy who allegedly retired after winning those three rings and 12 years in the NFL, my man is busy. He is the host of Schlereth and Evans on 104.3 The Fan in Denver. He's the host of the Stinkin' Truth podcast. He's a studio and game analyst for Fox Sports, and he is a food mogul with this stinking good green chili products, which are coming to a grocery store near you soon. In the middle of all that, my man managed to carve out some time for an excellent conversation that was long overdue. So pot up, F74 with my man Stink. Get spinning right now. Let's get it. Mark, listen, it was so good to see you the week of Super Bowl, and I thought it was time that you and I finally got caught up and did it right. How you living, my man? How are things? Things are good, man. They're bi- Like I always say, it's great when it's busy. As long as my phone keeps on ringing, I'm going to keep answering it. So, you know, it, things are good, man. It just is uh, life is busy, but life is good that way. Busy is good. Listen, I want to get caught up on a few of those things a little bit later on, but you know what? Why don't we go back to the beginning and just kind of start things off this way? It's not every day, even though you and I go way back, it's not every day I talk to somebody who was born and raised in the 49th state of Alaska, but you are a native of Anchorage, for those who do not know. You played your high school ball at Roberts Service High School. What was it like, Mark, growing up in the last frontier? It, you know, it was awesome. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Um, of course, I wouldn't want to move back there, all right, eight months of winter. Like, it, But it was the way the world worked, you know. I mean, the summertime was, you know, 20, 21 hours, 22 hours of daylight. And the, the wintertime was, you know, darkness all the time. But it's just the way the world operated at that point. So when you don't know any better, you, you find, you know, love and passion in, in everything that you do and, you know, we still played outside. It's pitch black out. We're doinking around. We used to have a lighted football. We played tackle football games with this little plastic football that had a light in the middle of it. So we're out there in these fields of snow, you know, and, and it might, we're, the only thing that was lit was the football. I mean, we just had a blast as kids. I loved growing up in Alaska. It was good to me. High school football was interesting. You know, it's, it's so funny because I chose to go to the University of Idaho over the University of Hawaii. And those are the two scholarships I had. And it's so funny, the first interview I ever did as a professional football player, I was asked why I made that decision. And uh, Leslie Visser was the recorder. She asked me, why did you make that decision? And I said, well, because of the climate of Idaho, is what I told her. And it was true, because at 18 years old, man, I looked at Hawaii, and I thought two things. One, I played six games in high school like that was our high school season and I didn't know how good I was or if I was any good at all and I didn't know if I could compete at at Hawaii the other thing that I looked at is like I I knew myself and I grew up in snow and slush and nastiness and I was like man I can't wake up to sunshine 300 days a year I think I'll go crazy so I was like I need some snow I need some winter time I need some change of season like, that's really why I picked the University of Idaho, which, looking back on it now, I'm like, damn, that's a pretty wise decision for some, you know, 18-year-old kid to make. That's wild. That really is wild. So, Mark, if, for instance, if you played six games a year and you were, like, 2,000 miles away from anybody who mattered, how were you able to get the attention of any college recruiters? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. My coaches sent out tape, and so I got asked at the time with Pac-10, and I got asked to walk on, like, at Oregon, Oregon State, and Washington, and all those schools. Um, but really what ended up happening is, is you know, I've always, I was always a gifted athlete. And, um, and two schools, Idaho and Hawaii, came up to some summer camp, you know. And 
it was some summer football camp. There was no pads. It was just run around stuff. And, you know, I was, I was, um, I'm a 6'3 and probably 215 or whatever, but I was pretty well put together and I could run and I could jump. And, you know, I had, I, I was just gifted as an athlete. And so they saw me at this camp and they were like, this kid can actually, this kid's actually a phenomenal athlete. And then when we sent the tapes to them, they're like, he's, he's a good football player, you know, even though it was against, you know, pretty weak competition. So, those two schools flew me in for uh, workouts, you know, and for uh, recruiting trips, and those are the two schools that offered me scholarships. So um, that was really how I got how I got a scholarship because none of the other schools were going to actually offer it to me from, uh, you know, being a kid from Alaska. All right, so it's a great choice. You go to Idaho. Then you get out of college. What were you thinking about your pro prospects coming out of college? <laughs> I was just like, listen, if I don't make it, it's going to be – that's fine. Like, if I'm not good enough, that's fine. I, I mean, I can live with that, but I was like, the the one thing they won't do is kick me out of this league from a lack of effort. Like I am, like I am going to come in here and I'm going to fight and claw with everything I got. And if I'm just not good enough, I can live with that. As a matter of fact, the first game I ever played in was the Hall of Fame game. It was against the Buffalo Bills, and my folks flew down from Alaska to Ohio to to come to the game. Right. And Canton, Ohio, Hall of Fame game, I went out and I played, you know, the, the starters played the first quarter. I played the rest of the game, and I played really well in that particular game. And the honest goodness, I, I didn't realize at the time, but I've talked to my parents about this. The, really, the reason they actually flew to Canton, Ohio to see me play in my first game is because, one, it was my first game, but they figured it'd be the only game in the NFL I ever played in. Wow. Like, they didn't think I had a shot. And, you know, I mean, I was an oft-injured guy. I was retired as a junior in college because of injuries. So I actually retired and begged my way back onto the, onto the playing field for my senior year and switched from the defensive side to the offensive side of the football. So I had no scholarship. I mean, I had no scouts. I, had, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have anything. Um, and what got me into the NFL was I had a teammate by the name of Marvin Washington who went on to play – uh, like 11 years in the National Football League, and he was a highly touted defensive end out of Idaho who was a basketball player who came and played one year, Jim, and got 14 sacks. And I'm sitting at my house. You know, we rented a house with like five guys. And I'm sitting at my house one evening, and my phone rings, and it's Marvin. And Marvin is just a – he's salt of the earth, man. I love Marvin. He's the reason I played in the NFL, actually, because he calls me up and says, hey, man – um, you know, whatever team is coming to work me out tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, why don't you show up to my workout? And so I showed up to Marvin's workout, introduced myself to the scouts, and just begged, like, please just let me work out for you guys. And, you know, I would blow the, – the crazy thing is, is I would blow Marvin away in everything, 40 times, bench press tests, eye tests, you know, shuttles, all that crap. And you would think – I probably cost him three rounds in the draft. He got drafted in the sixth round. I got drafted in the tenth round. But I probably cost him that just because my workouts were so much better than his. But faithfully, probably 15 times that guy called me during his workouts to invite me to his workouts. Now, the coolest part of the whole story is if it wasn't for Marvin Washington, I wouldn't have played in the National Football League. But after we won a championship in Denver in 1997 against the Green Bay Packers, I'm down in the training room, you know, rehabbing whatever surgery I just had. And Mike Shanahan, the head coach, comes down to the training room and says, hey, man, we need to fortify our defensive line. We need a guy that can play both D-end and, and D-tackle. Um, he's just like, I don't know these guys. I, I, you know, I just don't really know them that well. And he goes, but you've played against everybody. You've got you know, kind of a good knowledge, working knowledge, base knowledge of, of guys that you've played against. He goes, does any of these guys kind of fit our culture? And he gives me this list of about six guys, and Marvin Washington is on that list. And I, I just pointed to him and said, sign him. This is our guy. Mike Shanahan signed him, and Marvin and I won Super Bowl thirty three together as teammates. Holy shit! Is that is that, that's mean, amazing? How awesome is that? That that's amazing. What was it like for the two of you guys, Mark? That is such an amazing story. The way you lay that out, that he invited you to every single workout, and you knew it ultimately costed him because you outworked him every single time. And for you to pay it back that way, as you guys sat there after that game celebrating that win, what what was that moment like? What did that mean to the two of you guys, given everything you had gone through? Right. It was just surreal but it was so cool because we both looked at each other like dude here's a couple of scrubs from the university of idaho the only reason he went to the university of idaho is because his college basketball program 
got canceled his senior year. So he came up to Idaho to play basketball. He's bigger and more athletic looking than anybody we have on our team. And we're like, hey, dude, why don't you come out for football? And then he comes out for football and gets 14 sacks as a defensive end. So, like, had his college basketball program not got canceled, he went to, like, UTEP or something. Like, he would have never came to Idaho. Uh, Like, we just sat there and looked at each other like, can you believe the series of events that we have gone through? And here we are, you know, 11 years later, 10 years later, whatever it is, celebrating a world championship together. I mean, it's 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 a it was a surreal feeling. It still is. We laugh. We get to we still get together on a yearly basis, and we just laugh about it. Like, can can you imagine how blessed are we to have this story, this connectivity together? And that's the thing I love about professional sports, man. It bonds you together for life. Black, white, green, yellow, from a economic a place of economic prosperity to poverty does not matter when you become teammates. You bond together and you have lifelong connections that, um, you know, I'd do anything for Marvin. Hey, let me take you back. Remember the year 1999? Yeah, well, we're officially 20 years past that. So if you're no longer partying like it's 1999, then why does the software that you use at work every single day feel like it's not quite ready for Y2K? You need to turn the page now. You need to get more up to date with Capterra.com. Capterra, with over 700,000 reviews of products from real software users, discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Join the millions of people who use Capterra each month to find the right tools for their business. Listen, I'm not asking you to do something that I myself do not already do. I already had the same problem that many of you currently have. I was not up to date. Fact, I hated my software. Because I was way behind the times. Go to Capterra.com. Update your software. Let them help you. Capterra.com slash Rome. Go there right now. Capterra.com slash Rome. Go there for free today and find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Capterra.com slash Rome. Capterra, C A P T E R R A dot com slash Rome. Capterra.com slash Rome. Man, it's such an amazing story, Mark. And in the middle of that story, what you said was, I was coming off whatever surgery it was, and I believe you, you probably didn't remember exactly what it was. I think a lot of people know this, but you are, look, you don't play in that league unless you're a different guy, you're wired a different way, you're extremely fierce, you're extremely tough, but you were like next level about that. I mean, you got to break this down. Exactly what possessed you to play through 29 surgeries. That's not just a figure of speech. That's not a number. 29 surgeries, 20 on your knees, 15 on your left. I mean, dude, one, how, right. and two, why? Yeah, I, you know, it was always kind of a badge of honor for me. I, I think there's a couple of things that I that I looked at. Like, there's always a game going on, and if you don't know what it is, you're probably the game. Like, to me, there was a game within the game. Anybody can play this game when they're healthy or when they feel good. Like if it was easy, my critics would play it, right? It's not easy. It's exceptionally difficult. So like that was a game within a game for me. Can I, I I have shown up to the stadium with like an inability to walk. Like I have shown up to the stadium where I can barely walk, where I didn't practice all week, um, where I was on crutches at the beginning of the week and went out and whipped ass and took names on Sunday when I got there. And I took great pride in putting my teammates ahead of myself and saying, regardless of what the situation is, I am going to go out here and I'm going to get beat my ass off. And that was the inside playing a game. I was playing a game with myself. Like what, how much can I put myself through and still go out here and perform? Because it's not enough to just go out there you're going to play, you have to play hurt, you have to play injured, but you have to play well hurt and injured. And I had an ability mentally to just kick that stuff to the curb and say, I'm going to go out here regardless of how I feel, and I'm going to go open a can of whoop-ass on somebody. And that's just the way I approach the game. You know, I had a, I had a, uh, a, a bout, and I've had several bouts with kidney stones. I had a kidney stone. I woke up uh, one morning. It was a Sunday. It was a Sunday like late in the evening type of thing. We had a, we had a Monday night game. Um, so went to bed Saturday night, woke up Sunday, and was just writhing in pain. And I 
tap my wife. I go, man, I think I'm having a kidney stone. Turn my wife is it, you know, it's one o'clock in the morning. My wife go, go downstairs on the couch and see if you can sleep it off. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I go down on the couch to try to sleep off a kidney stone, right? Now I'm dying, Crazy. dry heaves and, and throwing up. And I'm just like, finally around four o'clock in the morning, my parents happen to be in town so they can watch the kids. I grab my wife. And I go, well, you got to take me to the hospital. So we go to the hospital. I'm in the hospital all day long. Um, that I cannot pass this kidney stone. It's so large. So uh. I'm, I'm like in here dying, right? Um, I'm all full of drugs and stuff. So they transfer me to a different hospital because they have to operate on me. <sighs> so at like 11 o'clock at night, they, they swing me down into the, to the surgery center. You know, you're in this operating room. My feet are up on the stirrups like I'm at a, a gynecologist's office, right? I mean, I'm up on the syrup, stirrups. Every person in that operating room is female. It, and it's cold in there, you know, so the bits and pieces are not, wow. you know, I mean, it's embarrassing. And, like, the anesthesiologist is female. Everybody in there is female. And I get the one gal comes in and says, I'm your scrub-down nurse. Are you allergic to iodine or, or you know, any? And I'm just like, would you please put me out for this? So they go through your Johnson into your bladder, through your bladder up to your ureter, which goes from your kidney down to your bladder and pull the kidney stones out. Fuck. So I literally wake up at one o'clock in the morning, like to take a piss. I have to have a shot of morphine because it's so painful. It's just, you're pissing needles. And then I check myself out of the hospital at 11 o'clock. I drive myself to pregame. I don't even eat anything at pregame. I roll down to the stadium. I get dressed and we play the Raiders and beat their ass 28 to nothing. And those are the things that if you want to play in this league, those are the things to me you have to be willing to do. And if you're not, you're not going to last long. That might be the worst shit I've ever heard in my life, Mark. I'm not even kidding. Put you out. Put you out for that. I wish somebody had put me out for that story. But <laughs> but you know what? I know that's true. Like my, my father, my old man, was not an athlete, but he pound for pound was about the toughest guy, that at least I've known in any normal walk of life. Like, the guy had leukemia, he had brain surgery, he had cancer, he never once complained, ever. Like, daily injections, all the chemo, never complained. But he did tell me once, he said, let me tell you something, I had two kidney stones, I had to pass that shit, it was the most painful thing ever. Right. Ever. Yeah. So I... I, oh, I it, it's un, it is un, until you've had them, it's just like, it's the most unbe- unbearable pain you could ever imagine. And... Um, and yeah, there's been, there has been, uh, I've had several bouts over the years, uh, with them. And, and he was 100% right. Your, your pops was 100% on, on cue, man. They are nasty. So let me ask you this. I mean, that, that, did you, were you always like that? I mean, were you wired for that? Did you learn that? What, what put that fire and that drive in you to say that, hey, no matter what, I'm going to keep coming? There is nothing that will keep me from achieving what I want to achieve. I will be out there and I can put myself through the fire that other people would not even, will, would not even be willing to attempt. Yeah, I think, you know, I think my father is wired that way. I learned a work ethic from him. He is a perpetual motion machine. The guy is 80 years old. He'll be 80 years old this summer. Um, On his 78th birthday, he benched 300 pounds. He's 180 pounds. He is an absolute freak show. Um, I'm telling you what, you know, to play in the National Football League, I tell people this all the time, you got to win the genetic lottery. I mean, you have to genetically, you have to be gifted. And then on top of that, you got to have, I don't give a shit attitude um, when it comes to what you're willing to put yourself through. And, and I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you know, the, the, the athletic part of it, the genetics part of it is a, the smaller part of it. I mean, most of you like listening to this podcast, um, you know, you get the guy that I'd have played if I wouldn't have torn this knee up. No, you wouldn't have. You know why? Because you're a pussy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have done it. Like, it just it doesn't work that way. Like, the majority of people who tell you they would have done it had it not been for coaching or business, no, you wouldn't have. You, you just wouldn't have because the majority of people just aren't insane enough to do it. You have to be touched. There, there has to be a level, and you don't have to be touched all the time. I'm the, the most mild-mannered person in the world, but you have to have a level of just – like craziness to be able to go put yourself through the stuff that we put ourselves through as players and, and, you know, and, and willingly accept it and go out and do it. 
I'll tell you again, Mark, who you sound like that you remind me of. And it's a guy you played with, Wild Man Bill Romanowski. Now, this is a big Romo house. I remember, I remember back then when he played the game, man. He was so fierce. He was fierce even to interview, much less play with or against. What was uh, Romo like as a teammate? And if you got a favorite Romo story you can share. Yeah, yeah. Well, Romo, like, Romo is, I always say, I love Romo. I wouldn't want to pick curtains out with the guy. Like, I don't want to live with him. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's a weirdo. <laughs> but he's a weirdo in a good way. You know what I mean? Like oh, I do. Just was like, like he was just, he's just that way. But the thing I loved about Romo, what I loved about, because I hated Romo when I played against him. When he played for the Niners or he played for the Eagles and I was with the Skins, you know, you're like, oh, I can't stand this dude. You know, you'd see him down the end of the line of scrimmage and, and you got counter called. You just want to run down there and try to break his neck, you know? Like that's, that's how you felt about him. Then you teammates with the guy. The guy plays hard. He shows up on Sunday. He's got an attitude. He he has an intimidating factor. He takes no shit off nobody. You know, you love having him on your team. But I can't tell you how many times. This is Romo, and, and this is what people don't understand about him. I can't tell you how many times he knew that I was struggling just to, just to make it to the field on Sundays, and I was struggling with whatever it was, whatever injury I had. And, you know, we lived in the same neighborhood. And sure enough, it'd be like 6.30 in the evening, right? And all of a sudden, somebody knock on my door. And I open up the door, and it's one of Romo's gurus. You know, his massage therapist, his active release guy. It's whatever his guru totally. uh, of, of that week was. And the guy would be like, hey, uh, Bill tells me you're really struggling with something. He sent me over here to work on you for the next hour. And I, I, I can't tell you how many times it's like he's picking up the tab. He just sent me over here to work on you. And I can't tell you how many times I got that knock on the door um, from from somebody Bill sent to my house and said, hey, go, you know what, I don't need it right now. You go work on him for me for a while. Hmm. And he did it, I mean, countless times, Jim, and that's the kind of teammate Bill Romanowski was. And, and uh, you know, forever I'll have a debt of gratitude for that. It's a great story. I'm not surprised to hear that either, Mark. So let me say about a brand new product we have for the podcast Outer Known Clothing. I've got these clothes. I've been wearing these clothes. They're great. I love the fit. I love the look. I love how they hit me out. I love how casual they are. No matter where I go, where I live, I'm feeling good about me. Look, finding high-quality clothes that fit great is not always easy. Outer Known was founded by pro surfer and 11-time world champ Kelly Slater. Also, they've got a mission to provide great clothes that do not harm the environment. Outer Known clothes are for people and planet. High quality, sustainable clothes, durable construction, and a great fit. Plus, Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. I brought them home. I put them on. My wife was like, damn, that's nice. You look great. Find out for yourself. Go to OuterKnown.com today. Enter my code ROME at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. And remember, use my code name ROME at checkout. Get 25% off. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com, and do not forget the promo code ROME and get your 25% off. I ran him down the week of Super Bowl before I saw you, and he came on. We talked about Super Bowl 33. And I asked him what he remembered most about that game. And he took us back to a hit. And he sounded, Mark, like he felt as if he had actually killed quarterback Chris Chandler. I want you to hear it. Listen to this. And I want to get your reaction to it. Early in the game, we had a fire blitz on. I was able to get a sack on him. And I tell you what, I hit him so effing hard. I don't know how he got up. And when I mean I hit him hard, to his core, I felt like I could have broke his spine. I hit him so hard. The fact that he got what up. What did you I, think when he got up? I was like, this guy's going to be a pile of crap the rest of the day. That's what I said to myself. Because you just don't know what I brought in that hit. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you. When you get that good hit on somebody, you know because it feels so good. It's like you hear at the bottom of the pile. Oh! <laughs> And, yeah, I don't care who it is. You can just hear it. Mark, this guy. And does that sound like the Romo you know and love? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is, like, I remember it. I remember, like, I'd have to look exactly what the scenario was. I know it was early, but I know they were down toward, uh, it, toward the red zone. 
like going in for a score. And I don't know if we turned them over, if it was there was a fumble or, or what, or if they missed a field goal or something of that nature happened there. But we were all on the sideline because, you know, normally when you – like as I got, off the, I got off the sideline or I got off the bench to watch two players play in my career. I got off the sideline or the bench to go watch Joe Montana and Barry Sanders. Those are the only two guys that ever got up to actually – you know, I'm just sitting down there sucking water. I'm a big, fat offensive lineman. I'm not going to get up. But you did get up uh, at the very end of, like, when a drive was about to be over. It's third down and nine, you know, and you know that you're going to punt. You get up and you start sauntering over, getting ready to get your helmet buckled up and stuff. So we were standing on the sideline. I remember them being in the red zone early in the game, and we're standing on the sideline getting ready to go in, you know, whether they're going to kick a field goal, man, whatever it is. And I just remember you, you, that hit, you could feel that hit from the sideline and we're and on the sideline. You're like, Oh shit. You know, that's like, that's one that you're like, yeah. And I, that's what I love about this game, man. That's why I hope they never legislate contact out of it because it's part of what it's part of what sets the game apart, you know? And, and I understand there's some inherent risks to playing the game. I get that. And I think most of us that play understand that and we're okay with that. Um, but but when you get those, like he talked about that visceral reaction and hearing that guy groaning on the, you know, underneath the pile, like when those things happen to you, you are just on the sideline, like high five and like, yeah, we got them, like we got them right where we want them. You feel like you just got the upper hand psychologically on that football team. Like we just crushed them. And now let's go, you know, now let's go return the favor. Now let's go. Uh, pay it off for the defense, and let's go put some points on the board. It, I, I remember the hit like it was yesterday. Man, that's some goosebump shit right there. Mark, go back to what you said, though. That there were only two guys in your entire career that got you off the bench, Joe Montana and Barry Sanders. You know, Give me the short version about that. Why those two guys, particularly? Well, because like, like you, you'd see Barry Sanders do shit like on highlights. Like, every time, back in the day, when you got done playing, and, and I feel bad for for guys now, because we used to get done playing, and maybe you get it all on, you know, in, on your phone, you know, and all those clips. But back in the day, we get done, man. You'd have some dinner, you'd roll back to your house, you would turn on ESPN, and you'd watch Chris Berman and Tom Jackson do the highlights. Right? Everybody, I mean, everybody just went, went home and watched how the league unfolded, and they it was it was just it was a great show. It was fun, and. You know, we used to just go, oh, man, we, as players, you'd want to see that stuff and see how all that, you know, all of it panned out during the course of Sundays. And, and that was kind of a, a big part of um, kind of the Sunday after the game. So I see all the, you know, Barry Sanders highlights, and he was just a, like, he's a freak show. Like, the guy was just an absolute freak show. So I get up because you just want to see, like he, you want to see him do like the shakedown folks and, and do the things he did that defied gravity. Um, the reason I got up to see Joe Montana was he was surgical in the way he dissected defenses. And I can't tell you how many times I played as an opponent uh, against Joe Montana. And you, you walk in there feeling like, Oh, these guys are soft and they don't practice in pads and we're calloused and we're tougher. We're going to whip their ass. And then you get on the bus after the game and you go, how did we just get beat 31 to 13? Like, how did that happen? And you look at the stat sheet and Joe Montana would be, you know, 23 of 27 for 287 yards and three touchdowns, you know, and it'd be off the charts. And so I got up just because I, I'd seen it before. I got up just to watch how surgical he was, pinpoint accuracy. It just was effortless. And, I mean, it's just one of those things that, as a player, you respect, you know, you respect greatness, but you respect just how effortless he made the game look. The way he's throwing a little slant to Jerry Rice and a swing pass to Roger Craig, and he's doing his thing, and they just methodically moved down the football field, and it looked, it looked from the sideline watching him orchestrate, it looked effortless. And, and that fascinated me because the game is not ever it's hard, you know? and to make it look as effortless as he made it look, I just wanted to see it for myself. 
you know, Mark, I come, I come from that same kind of generation. I'm of that age, and I remember back. I remember when he played. I remember the kind of awe that he inspired and the kind of aura that he had. I mean, it's it's kind of hot takey to try and compare guys across different generations to kind of go to that GOAT thing. But, I mean, you played the game. You follow the game. You still broadcast. Can you do that? I mean, if you had your choice, if you had to win one game, if you had to win one game and you had to bet your life on it, do you want Tom Brady or do you want Joe Montana? Yeah, I mean, six and one half dozen another. I'd like them both. I, I'd probably take Tom Brady. Um, and I am, like, I am absolutely fascinated. Well, here's what I'm fascinated about, Jim, is that, you know, most of us reach a level of success and we're sated by that success. Like, we, we lose the, the drive to continue to just push. And what fascinates me about the New England Patriots, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, is in the last 18 years, they've participated in nine Super Bowls, half of them, and won six of them. That's, I mean, it's crazy it's to me. It's crazy. And, and, and on top of that, like, how do you not become satisfied? How do you continue to grind? So I'm, I'm doing a Miami game, and um, I'm talking to Danny Amendola. And I say, hey, you know, just real quick, something you learn from Brady, like, Give me something you learned while you were playing in New England from, from Tom Brady. And he goes, insatiable appetite for knowledge. And he goes, here's the craziest thing. We get done, play a game on the road, right? And you know how it is, man. You get done with a game on the road. You shower. You put on, you know, your suit or whatever it is, you know, whatever the team mandates you wear home on the plane. So you put on your suit. You know, you pack up your crap. You put on your suit. You grab, they got little box, lunch, box lunches on your way out. You know, there's a sandwich in there, there's a potato chips, there's a cookie, and there's an apple, right? So you grab those, you grab a soda, or you grab a couple of beers, or whatever they have for you out there, and you walk and you sit down on the bus, right? And everybody talks about whatever happened in the game and this one big hit or this one big play and what you see on this, and we're all talking. He goes, I get on the bus, Tom Brady has already downloaded next week's opponent, and he's on the bus studying next week's opponent we just i mean we literally just ended the game an hour ago showered got our box lunches get on the bus and he's breaking down next week's opponent he goes he's he's got an insatiable appetite for success for knowledge he he is driven and it never changes like how do you have that much success and never just one day go hey man i'm just going to kind of cruise today i'm just going to just like Right? Isn't that human nature? Yes. Like, like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady defy human nature. And that's what fascinates me about their greatness. It's an amazing thing, especially when part of your job is getting hammered physically the way you do. And he just continues to grind and never gives in. And that is that's the most fascinating thing about them, that they just keep coming and they won't give in. So then you look at the game right now, Mark, and the game is just, it's different. It's interesting. Before I let you go, what about NFL free agency? It was wild this year. Let me just ask you about the Browns. They essentially push every chip to the center of the table. What do you make of what they've done? And where would you slot them in the AFC after all of these moves? Yeah, I mean, I think one, I think they've done a phenomenal job. You know, when I talked, I called a, a Browns game this year, and yeah, I, I was skeptical about Baker Mayfield because most of the colleges coming out, I've been told by some guys that I really respect that like, Hey, the only thing that you can really tell is arm talent. Like you don't know in the college system because you know, they, they throw the plays out on cards, you know, and the guys don't necessarily call them in the huddles and nobody plays under center. And it's just a different game. You know, the hash marks are wider. You got a wide side of the field. It's a different game and it's really hard to evaluate quarterbacks. And so, you know, I'm always like, I'm, I'm real skeptical of any young quarterback coming out based in, in, in a college scheme, you know, especially with these spread offenses. So I'm talking to John Dorsey, and John Dorsey, the general manager of the Browns, goes, let me tell you something, Stink. He goes, this dude, this kid, all balls, 100% balls. I mean, that's what he is. And he, he, you see him in practice. You see he demands perfection. Um, Freddie Kitchens, their head coach now, was their offense coordinator. He's like, let me tell you, I can give Baker anything. I can give him a route combination or call a play, and if he needs to tag every route, you know, if he needs to tag, like, we'll, we'll create a, a system that's called, you know, hey, two-jet special, right? 
and everybody knows what two-jet special is. But if somebody is confused, he can say, hey, X receiver, you're running a go. Uh, Z receiver, you're running a go. Um, you know, slot guy, you're running a go. Uh, the Y, what you're going to do is you're going to go 12 yards, you're going to run a, a, a deep over, you know. And, and a fullback, halfback burst, you're going to burst out, you're going to hit the, you know, the C gap, and you're going to burst across the formation opposite the way the tight end. He can tag every route in that particular play call any play call they have, they, they're like the, the kid's photographic. His memory is, is like photographic. He's, he's incredible that way. And you're hundred percent right. I, I mean, I called their game last year and I'm like, they are, you want to talk about talent, man. They've got a boatload of it. And now in free agency with going after and making the trade for Odell Beckham jr. And stuff, you've got to rate them at, at least on the top of the AFC North. Um, you know, neck and neck with Pittsburgh. Yeah, you always have to learn how to continue to win things. But I think they're as talented as any team I called in the AFC last year for sure. I literally, I can't take my eyes off them. I think they are on top of the AFC North. I can't wait to see how they look in this coming season. So, all that said, what are you hearing then about Kyler Murray and to see pass your eye test? Yeah, from a yeah, just from a pure football standpoint, athleticism, but the way he throws the ball. And the way he can go through coverage, you know, the, the way he can look um, at one side. And I think one of the things that you always see for me um, as I'm learning more and I'm sitting down watching film with coaches and stuff and, and kind of really evaluating the quarterback process, really when you go through progressions, it's one side to the next side. And so that's how, the, that's how they're teaching it now more than where it used to be, hey, go one, two, three, and four. It's going from – you know, right to left or whatever, left to right, whichever side you're reading the progression first. So you read the defense. You're not reading the routes. You read the defense, and then you're getting back to the back side um, if that side is covered. And the thing about Kyler Murray that you see on a consistent basis is he can, he can discern the information based on what the defense is doing, and instantly, like, if it's, if it's open, he'll get, I mean, the ball is out, and it's on target, and it's on time to his receivers. If it's not, based on the defense, you see him go one side, bam, to the next side, and just unleash it. And it tells me that he understands defenses. He understands what teams are in. He understands how to read them. And he understands where the open guy is going to be based on what he sees on the front side. And that, to me, um, you know, that to me is a, a huge indicator that, like, he's going to be successful the next level because he's got that kind of understanding of the passing game and understanding, more importantly, of what defenses are trying to do to him. Hey, listen up. Nobody really has time to go to the post office, right? You're busy. Nobody's got time for all that traffic or the parking, lugging in your mail and your packages. It is a tremendous hassle. This is why you need Stamps.com. It is one of the most popular time-saving tools for small businesses. Stamps.com eliminates all trips to the post office and saves you money with discounts that you can't even get at the post office. As an example, with Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first-class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail not to mention it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters stamps.com is an absolute no-brainer it saves you time it saves you money it's no wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use stamps.com check it out I'm using it you should too right now you can get a special offer which includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Simply go to Stamps.com, hit the microphone, which is at the top of the homepage, and type in Rome. Stamps.com, enter Rome. I love the product. It saves me time. It saves me money. It is the best thing there is. Stamps.com, enter Rome. Mark, I want to hit you up with two quick things before I go, man. It's so great to get caught up with you. I so appreciate your time. In addition to everything you're doing, though, right now, you are a food mogul. You are the co-owner of Stinkin' Good Green Chili Products, which are now in over 300 stores and counting. How did you first get into it, and how is the food biz treating you? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I got into it because um, my last year playing for the Broncos, I, I hurt my knee the first day at camp. And I'm a big landscaper, so I do all my own yard work. I uh, I love to just be out in the yard, uh, and I spend a lot of time out there during the summertime. So, you know, I mow, I do the landscaping aspect, I do I do everything, plant, you name it. Um, and so it's kind of it's it's kind of cathartic for me. I, I love it. Uh, I love putting a project together and seeing it come to completion. You know, and so um, I'm hurt my very first day at camp, 
So there's this landscaper in the neighborhood that takes care of Tommy Nalen lived there, Bill Romanowski lived there, a couple coaches lived there. So he knocks on the door, talks to my wife, mows the lawn for us, and I go find him after, you know, a couple of weeks after I'm back on my feet and um, to thank him. And he says, I make the greatest green chili in the world. I'd like to bring you some. Now, I didn't even know what green chili was, Jim, but I was, you know, 300 pounds, and he was going to bring me food. I was like, hell yeah, bring some food over, right? (laughs) Right. And I just fell in love with it. And it became a nine-year relationship with me and my buddy. His name is David Bloom, where he would bring green chili over every couple of months. And uh, the joke was, you ought to bottle this stuff and sell it. And 10 years ago, he came to me and goes, hey, listen, man. Um, I'd like to bottle this stuff and sell it. I need a, you know, I need a name, a partner, and I need it financed. And so I was like, I'm in. So we started this thing 10 years ago. And um, you know, food business is tough, man, but it's uh, rewarding and it's fun and we're growing. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's been a kind of a labor of love. And, um, you know, we always, anytime you get into something like that, you know, I wish I'd have known then what I know now, I always joke around. I probably would have picked something else to put my money in, but uh, it's been a it's been a really kind of cool labor of love, and and like I said, we're growing and we've got some cool things going on right now. Good for you. Listen, last thought. You speak about love. I think the thing, one of the things I've always admired about you, Mark, is obviously you can tell the love that you have for your family, your family for you, the kids. If I'm not mistaken, when I talked to you briefly at Super Bowl, I think Alex was there. I'm not sure if Avery was there. But I also Uh saw recently on social, you posted about your son Daniel, and he was in camp with the Red Sox and trying to get back to the big leagues for the first time since 2012. How much pride do you have in watching him go out there and battle? Uh, Just a ton, man. You know, somebody asked me, about, um, you know, my most humbling experience in sports. And, you know, there's a lot of times I've gotten my ass kicked and I've given up some plays, you know, and done some things that aren't great. But I said, you know, really, when I talk about humbling, I I use it in a different context. The most humbled I've ever been in sports, the most thankful, was not being introduced to three Super Bowls or winning those things, you know, and, and getting rings and all that was the first time I watched my son trot out against the Atlanta Braves to throw the sixth inning um, in a game in May um, in the big leagues. And um, humbled to have been there um, and to see that. I mean, I consider everything, you know, I've ever done in sports garbage next to watching that happen for our family. So um, the fact that he's still grinding, the fact that he's still fighting, the fact that he is calling in favors – and saying, please just give me a workout. Just let me, like, I, I just couldn't be more proud of, of the way he has worked, the way he has fought. And, you know, it's been a tough, he's been hurt and injured and availability, not the strong suit. And he just keeps battling. And it's been a seven year now since or five, six years since he's been in the majors. Um, and, to the point where he pitched in the independent league in New York last year just to get himself an opportunity to get back in. Um, the, the kid has got zero quit in him. And, you know, regardless whether this is the last year, whether he makes it back or whether he doesn't, um, I've just been proud of the fight um, and the just indefatigable effort that he gives to, to keep his dream alive. We know where it comes from. How about some equal time before you go for the ladies? Avery, she was great. Avery posted on social this week, quote, true story. When I was 15, my dad told me to stop using the elliptical and start lifting weights. And I thought, wow, I thought I could trust you, but you're trying to bulk me up. How rude. Now all I do is lift, and I've never been more pleased with my body. So thanks, Dad? Question mark. What's she like? What's Avery like? Avery is hilarious. She is uh she is the most carefree spirit, and um, I tell you what, she's a, a wonderful. She's just wonderful. She's awesome. I have so much fun with her. She is very much her father's daughter, you know, uh, very much she my personality. Um, and I tell you what, she works her ass off, too. And, you know, she works for a, a company. She does all their social media stuff for Sweet Sweat. She gets paid to work out. She's like, I have the greatest job in the world. All I do is work out. And you know, gets paid to go to workout classes and then post all about them. And, and she absolutely loves it. And um, she trains a few people. She's just done an unbelievable – she's been remarkable. And part of her story is she came out here. She had modeled – you know, she was the face of my twin doll. And she was the face of Ure. And 
she had a bunch of different national campaigns when she was a young kid. And then her thyroid crapped out at 19 and she gained a bunch of weight and got dumped from her agency, her modeling agency and everything else. And it was a really tough kind of two years trying to find out the balance on that. And, um, and all she's done is worked her ass off and, uh, and it's, it's cool to watch, you know, it's cool to watch them work hard for something. And then, you know, the blessings that, that ensue from that hard work. So, uh, she's hilarious. She's a she's an absolute hoot. And then finally, what about Alex? Is she still acting? She does a little bit, but you know what? She works here at Fox with me, so she's in the uh, in the opposite end of uh, the spectrum now. She did a lot of television stuff for a long time and some acting stuff, and now she's working um, here at Fox on the production side of things. So she's actually doing carving out herself a nice little career here at Fox and. Um, as soon as you and I hang up, I'm going to go have coffee with her. We we do coffee at least twice a day when I'm out here. Um, so it's really cool. It's, you know, every – it's awesome. I mean, it's like, oh, uh, you know, I roll in the morning, I get done doing a TV show, and I go grab her from her desk, and we go eat, drink coffee and do whatever. And so we've got two coffee dates every day, um, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And, I mean, how does it get any better than that? It's as good as it gets. I don't want to keep you from that, Mark. Listen, it, it is so awesome to get caught up with you. I mean, I understand I understand that you understand how this process goes because you've been on both sides of it and you've had such a great broadcast career. But, man, I, I cannot thank you for being locked in, focused, making time for it. And it was really, really good to get caught up because you and I do go so far back. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure, man. I always have appreciated uh, your grind, your business, and um, and you've always – you've always done right by me so and you've always uh you've always given me a platform man when a lot of people wouldn't so i appreciate you jim it's uh always great to get caught up and i appreciate your friendship when it gets cold out there your vehicle needs some extra attention o'reilly auto parts has everything you need to keep your vehicle toasty warm from choosing the right antifreeze for your engine To replacing your windshield wiper blades, O'Reilly will help you get your car or truck in fighting shape for the cold weather ahead. O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. Big ups to Stank for that amazing pod. What an absolute beauty. If you enjoyed the conversation, make sure to hit my guy up and let him know about it. He's at Mark Schlereth on Twitter, at Mark Schlereth. And while you've got those thumbs working, go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. 74 episodes in, and it gets better and stronger. So you don't want to miss a thing, right? If you get subscribed, you'll never have to worry about missing it because each new installment will automatically download on your listening device. You don't need to go looking for it. It will find you. It's simple. It's easy. It's smart. It's intuitive. So just do it. And I appreciate it. Back next week with F75, but until then, here are some voicemails. First new message. Musicians go to South by Southwest, not magicians, Shane. Your beat down to Shane is one of the greatest things in history, in the history of comedy and righteousness. Holy crap, dude. He inspired you to five minutes of your greatest stuff. Thank you for being who you are, man. You are Radio Hall of Fame times a trillion. Message saved. Next message. Jim, this is Bud. I'm watching the show DVR, and uh, Hawk needs a GoFundMe page to uh, bail him out of that entry fee that he's paid. You know, everybody will kick in a buck here and get him off the hook here, and he won't kill himself. I'm out. Message deleted. Next message. What's up, Romy? It's Dr. Dave. Message deleted. Next message. Hey, Jim. It's Caitlin in NorCal. Just calling to thank you so much for the awesome podcast with Brian Koppelman and David Levine. Uh, couldn't get enough of it. And I just started watching the first season of Billions. And now I need to figure out how to get my mother-in-law to pay for Showtime so I can watch the rest of them. You're super awesome, bringing us amazing content all the time. Um, just love it when two worlds collide with Brian Koppelman and Jim Rome. Um, you guys are super awesome. Thank you. Bye. Message saved. Next message. Romeus, what's up, man? This is David from Buffalo calling in uh, to talk about the NCAA tournament. I guarantee you the Lakers GM, LeBron James, is going to be at a couple games. I'm out. Message saved. You have no more messages. Hey, Alvy. You stink. Message deleted. Next message. Hi, uh, Hawk and um, Jim. It's Andy from Rockland. So I was just watching um, Hawk's 
uh, golf swing, and I'm pretty sure that he used the wrong club. All right, so I love you guys, um, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Message saved. You have no more messages.